Hello and welcome, my name is Jonas Pils, I'm Master Trainer at Maxon and today I want to introduce you to Redshift. So this presentation will be split into three parts. First, I want to introduce you to the concept of Redshift. Then we're going to have a live demo inside of Cinema 4D using Redshift. And after that, I want to show you a few more of the key advantages of Redshift in the second part of the keynote. So let's get started. We are going to start with the question, what is Redshift? And on the Redshift website, it says that Redshift is the world's first fully GPU accelerated biased renderer. So what does that mean? Well, fully GPU accelerated means that Redshift is a GPU renderer. It's running on the GPU only. And biased means that Redshift does not necessarily do stuff as it would happen in nature, but it would fake some things in order to optimize them for rendering. So again, what does that mean? First of all, being a biased renderer means that Redshift is fast. And I mean, it's really fast. And the second thing is that it's really flexible. Whenever you work with a sample-based renderer as Redshift, it is good to have full control over all of the samples that are going to be shot into the scene. But on the other hand, if you want to create a quick render or you don't want to mess with all of these settings, you don't have to use them. You can switch to automatic mode and Redshift will do everything for you. But coming back to speed, let's talk about how fast Redshift is. And of course, we can talk about this a lot, but let me show you some actual numbers. But a little bit of background information here. My GPU on my office machine is an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 2070 Super. And using this GPU, I rendered this sequence here. Let me play it. So that's a little shot that can be part of an architectural visualization project. And I rendered this on that GPU. Now, here are some numbers. I rendered 91 frames in full HD and the total render time was two hours and 38 minutes. That's an average render time per frame of one minute and 45 seconds. Now, imagine that we had a second GPU in that machine, then we could bring down the render time to something like 50 seconds per frame in full HD. And that is crazy fast. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the material light and camera system inside of Redshift. And of course, Redshift is coming with its own material light and camera system. And the reason for that is simply that every renderer wants to optimize their camera's lights and materials for the rendering process and for the rendering algorithms. Same happens here with Redshift. And one cool thing is that Redshift's materials are node-based. So you can really flexibly create your materials and have, for example, one texture that is linked into the color, the bump, maybe some reflection roughness and so on. And as soon as you replace that texture in the texture node, it will be replaced in the whole material. So Redshift's node-based materials are another thing that allows for maximum flexibility. All right, now it's time to show something, but before we jump into Cinema 4D, let me tell you what kind of machine I have here, because I'm not in the office, obviously. So currently I'm working on a MacBook Pro and I've got an eGPU connected to it, which is an AMD Radeon Pro W5700. All right, and now let's jump into Cinema 4D to see Redshift in action. Here we are in Cinema 4D and whenever you have Redshift installed, you will find it up here in the main menu and you can create a bunch of objects from here or have a look at the preferences. And here you can see the Redshift version as well as the graphics card or cards you are using. Here's the one I mentioned earlier. All right. So one of the most important things in Redshift is that we need a view that allows us to interactively preview our scene. So there is the Redshift render view and the Redshift viewport IPR, and I will use both of them. For now, I have this scene here. I will have another scene in a few minutes. For this scene, let's use the Redshift render view. And this comes as a separate window. This is a rendering I created earlier. And once I hit play here, you can see that Redshift is transferring the geometry over to the GPU and starts rendering. We can now move the viewport here and you can see that the IPR 
is reacting instantly and therefore we instantly see what we are doing. We can set up materials like that, we can create the lighting like that and it's just amazing. Now the Redshift render view also allows you for example to create snapshots and compare them simply by using these buttons here. It allows you a little bit more than the viewport IPR. Also you can have a region tool here just to render a region. All right, let's make it a little bit smaller again and let's have a look at the materials. We have a copper material and one that includes some subsurface scattering and I want to recreate those materials. So let me pause the rendering here and let's just get rid of these two materials and let's also get rid of the materials down here in the material manager and let's recreate them. Okay, first let's have a look at the renderer we are currently using because this Redshift render view will always use Redshift as the renderer, but we can also have a look here at the render settings and now you can see that the renderer is set to Redshift. This is important for now because there are two ways of creating Redshift materials. One is to go to create down here and Redshift materials and here you can create those materials using the shader graph which is based on Expresso or you can go to create materials node material and this will automatically create a node material in the node space for Redshift. You can see that up here. Up here we can choose the node space, we can use standard physical or Redshift or we can set it to current which will always use the current renderer. This is why I set it to Redshift. Okay, so in here we now have a Redshift material. If I double click here you see these nodes and these are Redshift nodes. All right, you can see that the interface is now a little bit cluttered with stuff. So what I already did is I created a layout for Redshift. So let's use this instead. So now the preview is a little bit um, pixelated, but this will be gone in a second. So let's deactivate the previews in order to save some space and also make this one a little bit smaller. And we want to recreate the copper. So let's double click here, that's the material manager, and rename this to copper. And let's also assign it already to the spline mesh geometry here. And I will create a copy of the copper material, call this green, hit enter, and just apply it to the other one. And now with the copper selected so it's available here in the node graph, I will hit render again and this will start the rendering once the whole scene is on the GPU again. Okay, now we can set up our materials. Let's start with the copper and here in the material node, if we go back to the attributes, you can see that we have a few tabs here. So there is a tab for the base properties. This is basically where you can set up a complete material, which includes a diffuse color, reflections, refractions, and also subsurface scattering. But there is an advanced subsurface scattering for skins, which also includes the different layers for skin. Then there is a separate coating layer, an overall tab where we have things like opacity, emission or bump, and some other tabs for optimizations and advanced settings. We keep on doing stuff here in the base properties. And one thing you might have noticed is this first little parameter that is called preset. And in here we can go to aluminum, for example. So now that material is aluminum. We can go to glass. So now it's a glass and we can try all of these different things. The cool thing is that all of the parameters here will adjust so we can tweak them further. So let's go back to copper because we want to use a copper material and we want to create a little bit more variation. So let's say we want to go to reflection and here is the reflection roughness and we want to control this reflection roughness by using a texture. Therefore, we need a texture and I will go to the content browser to get one. Click the magnifying glass here and search for a smudge map like so. 
And I like this one here, so let's just drag and drop it into the node editor. And I will deactivate the preview, we don't need it for now, and hit the solo button here. Now we can see that the texture is soloed. And by default, the material is set using um, UV coordinates. And because this whole geometry has been created using a volume builder and a volume measure, we have this spherical mapping on it. We want to change that. And we can either set the mapping in the texture tag here to cubic, but then we would see seams here on the model. So what we use instead is a node called triplanar. And I'm gonna hit C to bring up the nodes commander and type in tri and here it is. I'm gonna bring it to the node graph simply by dragging and dropping it. I'm gonna deactivate the preview here to save some space and just wire the texture up and set it to image X. And now I set the triplanar node to solo. And here you can already see that this is much better now. So here we can see that the texture is not as stretched anymore. We can adjust the tiling a little bit. So let's go down in the texture node to the remap options and let's set the scale to three by three. That's actually the tiling. And here in the triplanar node, the cool thing about that is that it actually works a little bit like cubic mapping, but with the advantage that we have a blend amount here. So we can blend between the textures. And as soon as I do so, you can see that we are blending here. And this is much better than before because we don't see the seams anymore. And now, because we want to use this to control the roughness here in the material, we need to remap it a little bit because whenever you control a parameter using a texture, black areas of an image mean that there is no effect, so 0% roughness in this case, and white areas are 100% roughness in this case, 100% effect. So what we want to do is we want to remap these values so they are, for example, between 20 and 40%. And in order to do so, I'm gonna hit C here again and type in gradient and you can see that the ramp node pops up. Although I type in gradient, there is the ramp node, so you can see that the tagging is also working. I just drag and drop it onto the existing wire. And now I'm gonna scroll down here in the ramp options and just double click one knot. And I'm gonna set this one to, let's say, 20% and the other one to 40%. And now I remap the values of black and white to 20% gray and 40% gray. And you can also see it here. It's not as contrasty anymore. And we can pipe this triplanar node into the material reflection roughness. So let's do that and let's unsolo the triplanar node. And here we go. Here you can see a little bit of the variation in the reflection. We can also make it a little bit more contrasty again. So maybe let's unfold the color here and let's bring this down a little bit. So we have a little bit more contrast, a little bit more glossiness in here. And now you can see that this is working pretty well. We could also do this with the reflection weight, which is the strength, simply by using this triplanar node also in reflection weight and this would be the same, but it doesn't look as good. So I simply double click the wire to get rid of that. And here we go. Now it's all good again. Okay, now let's create the subsurface scattering material. So we go to materials, we double click the green one and go back to attributes. And in here, we don't need any textures. So we just set this diffuse color here to something greenish, something like so. And then we go down here in the properties. Maybe let's fold the diffuse, the reflection, the sheen. We don't need that. We need to go to the refraction and transmission options and down here to subsurface. And there are two subsurface scattering modes and one is extinction. And I prefer that. 
And now let me also enable the backlight that I already set up. I'm gonna deactivate the dome light and instead I'm gonna activate the backlight. And as you can see, it's all black now. Here is the backlight. And I want to use that in order to set up the subsurface scattering. So in the extinction coefficient, I'm gonna bring up the value here. And I'm also going to bring up the scatter scale. And now you can see that something is happening here. By using the scatter coefficient, we can also adjust the colorization of the subsurface scattering. And you can see that it's all live. So I'm already pretty happy with that. So I'm going to switch back on my dome light. And now I also have my subsurface scattering effect in here. Now let's simply check for a nice framing like so and let's render this to the picture view. I'm gonna stop the render view here and I'm also going to go back to my startup layout and now I'm gonna hit render. So this is a rendering in the resolution 1280 by 720. It's extracting the geometry right now and I want to show you the speed of this whole thing in this rendering. All right, I'm gonna fast forward this a little bit so it's going even faster. And here we go. One minute and 29 seconds for a rendering that contains rough reflections and also subsurface scattering. That's pretty good. All right, now let's go to another scene, which is my bathroom scene, my bathroom vanity scene. And what I want to show you here is how to set up some lighting. I go to the redshift menu and I'm gonna use the Redshift Viewport IPR for this one. So this brings up just a little window and if you hit play, you can see that the actual rendering is happening in the viewport instead of a separate window. And this allows you to directly interact as you render here in the viewport, which is pretty cool. All right, so as you can see, by default, this doesn't look really nice it's actually pretty flat and so on and what you can also see is that everything except for the models here except for the geometry is black and this is exactly the reason for the whole thing being so flat because there is no lighting but in a physically based renderer such as redshift everything is a reflection so you need something to reflect in order to make the materials and the objects look good all right and the first thing I always do when I start lighting a scene is I go to Redshift, Lights, and I use a dome light because the dome light is a dome, so you have a reflection background for everything. And as you can see, it's already looking much better than before. There is some shadow here. You can see that inside the doors it's shadowy and also there is some reflection here in the mirror, of course, it's pure white because the dome light doesn't come with a texture by default, but we can change that. So again, let's go to the content browser and this time we search for HDR to bring up all of the HDR textures and I'm just going to use this one here. So I'm going to drag and drop it into the dome map and here we go. Now we have something that is reflecting and I'm also going to rotate the whole thing. So let's go to the rotate tool and let's rotate it. And this is the advantage of the viewport IPR that I can just use the gizmos here inside of the viewport, all of the handles and move them around, rotate them and so on. And the viewport will react. Okay, let's say that I'm happy with this and I just want to add another area light. I just want to add a light that is coming from the top here. So what I do is I go to Redshift, Lights, and this time I'm gonna add an area light. So here we go, this is the area light. You can see that it's way too bright and of course it's also way too big. So maybe let's zoom out a little bit and first let's move it up. Then let's scale it down to something like this and I also want to scale it so that it's non-uniformly scaled like so. I want to rotate it by 90 degrees 
something like this and then just move it up. And I'm gonna do this in the side view here. Let's just place it somewhere up here. So that's cool. I'm happy with that. And you can see this is a really interactive process now. So there is no waiting for the rendering and such things. One thing I don't like about this right now is that the light, the area light that we just created is a little bit too bright. So I select the area light and in the general tab, I go down to the intensity multiplier and I can just play with the intensity. And I like something like this. That's pretty cool. And maybe I also want to adjust the light color. I can also do that. So let's bring up the color here and let's give it a little bit of a warm tint, something like this. And now let's say that we finished the lighting and we want to find a nice camera angle and then we want to add some depth of field to make it look even more interesting. So let's say this is the angle that we want, something like this. And yeah, now let's add a camera so we can add depth of field. We don't use this camera here. We go to Redshift cameras and use the standard camera. There are also other cameras, of course, for now we need the standard camera. And this will create a camera, a Cinema 4D camera with a Redshift camera tag on it. Now, the cool thing is that the Redshift camera tag is capable of reading stuff here in the Cinema 4D camera. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up the camera. First of all, I'm going to use the focus picker here and pick the focus, let's say here. This is going to be our focus. And then I'm going to go to physical and I'm going to bring down the f-stop to one. So we get extreme depth of field. And then I'm going to go to the Redshift camera tag and there is a tab called Bokeh and this is where we can uh, set up depth of field and we have to override the global render settings and enable the depth of field. And now you can already see that we have some depth of field. The focal plane is in place and it's also using our f-stop of one because derived from camera is set to focus distance and COC radius. All right, now let's say that the depth of field is a little bit too much. So let's select the camera again and let's bring up the f-stop, let's say to two. And I think this is a pretty good value. I'm happy with that. We can also still rotate the camera and stuff like that. I'm gonna undo the camera move. And now let's say we want to render this. So I'm going to disable the Redshift viewport IPR and I'm gonna hit render up here because we want to render this to the picture viewer and here you can already see that this is quite fast i didn't speed this up yet i'm going to speed it up in a second so that we can finish this rendering a little bit earlier all right it's finished you can see that we rendered a resolution of 1280 by 720 again which is not too big but it took only one minute and five seconds to complete the rendering in full hd like 1080p, this would be around two minutes, a little bit more than two minutes. So this is pretty awesome because it's photorealistic. It's absolutely great to show some stuff in this case for architectural visualization. And it is so fast that you don't really have to wait for the rendering because it was just a minute. So this is really cool. Now let me get back to the keynote presentation so I can show you a few others of the key features of Redshift. Okay, you already saw how you can create materials and how to set up a lighting situation. Now I want to talk about other key features of Redshift. And the very first one I want to talk about is out of core geometry and textures. That's a technology which is pretty powerful because it allows you to render really big scenes using Redshift. As you might know, with GPU rendering, the restricting factor is always video memory or GPU memory. So if you have a small graphics card with let's say 8 gigabytes of memory or 12 that's not as much as 64 gigabytes of ram but what redshift is capable of is streaming the geometry and textures from the ram 
onto the GPU and directly render it. This allows you to create huge scenes with a lot of geometry and a lot of textures, which is definitely necessary when you want to create, for example, a huge VFX rendering or something that needs more than the available video memory. All right, Redshift also comes with a powerful AOV system and AOVs are arbitrary output variables and you might already know them from Cinema 4D where they are called multipasses. So what you can do with the AOV system is, for example, you can split up your rendering into the diffuse component, into reflection, into refraction, direct illumination, global illumination. You can create a depth channel or a motion vector and all of this supporting the 32-bit OpenEXR workflow. The next cool thing is support for instancing. Redshift supports Cinema 4D's instances, but Redshift also comes with its own instancing system where the instances are created on the GPU. And this is again for optimization reasons. So if you would instantiate any object in the Cinema 4D scene and then bring it over to the GPU, it would need much more memory than if you just bring it over to the GPU once and create multiple instances of it on the GPU. You can also render particles using Redshift, including changes in colorization over time and so on. Hair is also supported, so if you have a character with hair, that's no problem. Or if you want to render a carpet with some hair or fake grass, all of this is possible. Redshift also comes with support for volumetrics, so you can load in any VDB sequence or file and just render it using the Redshift volume shader. But it also has a very powerful environment object that allows you to create fog and therefore very atmospheric environments. And the last thing I want to name here is command line rendering. Of course, you can use Redshift to distribute your rendering over the network so you can speed up the rendering using the full power of all of your machines. Cool. Another important question is which host systems and applications are supported by Redshift? And I want to start with the host systems. Of course, Redshift is available for Windows, but also for Linux and for Mac OS. On Windows and Linux, it is based on CUDA. So you have to use an NVIDIA graphics card if you want to use Redshift on a Windows or Linux system. And on Mac OS, Redshift will use Metal. So you would have to use an AMD card on Mac OS. The Mac OS version is currently in beta and uh, you need Big Sur for that, but it already works like a charm, although it's beta. Now, the host applications are Cinema 4D, Maya, 3ds Max, Houdini, Katana and Blender. The Blender version is also in beta at the moment. Now let's talk about the benefits of Redshift in general. First of all, of course, it is production proven. Many studios are already using it in their production pipeline, of course, because it's so feature rich. I mean, I showed you the feature set before and it's just incredible, such as the speed of Redshift. You've also seen that. And also the flexibility with node based materials and all of the settings regarding sampling that you can choose, but you don't have to, as I told you before. And of course, another benefit is that Redshift is available for all the TCCs that I showed you on the previous slide. Now here we have motion graphics and design. Here we have visualization. In this case, it's architectural visualization, but it can also be industrial visualization or medical. It doesn't matter. Redshift is really good for all sorts of visualization. Redshift is also being used in visual effects. And this is a shot from The Expanse. Some of you might know it. And here we have animated film as well. Redshift is being used in all branches where you have to generate nice imagery. All right, that's pretty much the end of the video. I hope you now have an idea of what Redshift is capable of and how fast it is. Please go to the Redshift website and download it today so you can start testing it and also follow us on social media and see you next time. Bye.